Thanks to technology, hello from the past. And I'm really looking forward to joining the Q&A later, still from this room, but in the present, um, joining with all of you live for the Q&A. I am Yael Fitzpatrick. I am the Editorial Ethics Manager for PNIS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, in that role, I work with a really great team of colleagues, of researchers, of folks both within the academy and elsewhere, serving essentially as the ethics ombudsperson for the journal. So for this session, I'm going to be touching on ethics perspectives from the publisher side, and I'm going to be speaking mostly about STEM publishing, just because that's the, the bulk of my experience in my career is in STEM publishing. publishing. Um, but I do think that a lot of the concepts are really universal, and I'm always interested to hear perspectives from the humanities and social sciences folks um, in the room and elsewhere. So why are we talking about disinformation and misinformation in scholarly publishing? It's been said before, it's going to be said again, Currently, we're just living in this like bonkers reality of distrust in the truth. It's ridiculously concerning. And so while it's always important to combat misinformation and disinformation and to disseminate information with honesty and with transparency and with a goal of trust, it's all the more important in, in this day and age. The entire process of research and its dissemination relies on a really inherent level of trust. So let's think about what publishers can do to combat misinformation and disinformation and to support that vital trust. So just to start, I want to touch on kind of a, a brief overview of the kinds of research publishing ethical issues that there are out there are that are out there. This is far from an exhaustive list, but it's a good starting point at least. Image-based concerns are a massive part of this. Um, this is oftentimes when there are concerns within images and research figures, concerns such as duplications, potentially manipulated images, and so forth. Text-based issues are um, um, oftentimes very prevalent as well. Kind of the a, a big bucket of those are concerns about plagiarism. Competing interests oftentimes becomes a really sticky issue. This can be a, a financial competing interest or a personal competing interest or a, um, a collaborative competing interest, whether it be between authors or reviewers or editors or others. Authorship disputes are also a, a really big category of ethical concerns. For example, there might be an author on an article who is not happy that they they say they weren't credited properly for the work that they did in a study, or there might be a researcher who wasn't listed as an author on a paper, and they come and say, hey, you know, I should have been given credit for, um, for my contribution to this work. Authorship disputes are tricky when it comes to publishers because publishers, by and large, do not adjudicate authorship disputes. Um, most publishers will act on the results of an assessment that has been made about an authorship dispute, but by and large, and this is certainly the case for PNAS, publishers do not have the, um, the jurisdiction to, for instance, sequester information, sequester lab books, to garner all of the necessary information to make an assessment about an authorship dispute. So when that comes up, we'll turn it back to the authors, um, tell them that they need to kind of sort it out on their own. If they can't do that, they need to enlist assistance from their institution or their funding body or somebody else. We'll then take that information and act on it accordingly. Duplicate submissions are another big category of ethical issues. Most journals have very strict policies that if, an, if a manuscript has been submitted for review, it cannot have been submitted elsewhere at the same time for review. That's not the same as preprints. It's fine for an article to be submitted as a preprint and then also be submitted for peer review at our journal or most other journals. The problem comes when somebody wants to throw their manuscript hat into multiple rings and kind of, you know, put it out there for review in multiple places at the same time to see what happens. That's an ethical breach um, by most people's policies. It's highly problematic. It's also, also highly problematic to catch because unless there's something like a preprint to look against, 
most publishers have very confidential policies and editorial practices. They might not be aware that something has been submitted multiple places at the same time. By and large, if there are cases of duplicate submissions, they are found kind of by chance. For instance, if the same person was asked to review a manuscript at two different publishers, and then they come out and say, oh, wait, hey, this is weird. And then they kind of give a, give a, a heads up to everybody. Data sharing is always going to be an ethical issue. Um, again, most publishers have very clear policies that researchers need to share their data. Um, Sometimes researchers don't want to comply with that for various reasons, um, and it's, it's, it's an issue that needs to be addressed. Human and animal welfare concerns become a really sensitive ethical issue. Sometimes there might be a concern that human subjects in a study were not treated in an ethical way or that animals, animal participants in a study um, were not treated um, with the level of, of care and comfort that one might want. This becomes another sticky thing because most publishers don't set the rules for what is acceptable. They follow rules established by others, such as NIH, such as um, larger governing bodies. Um, and so it becomes really delicate. If, for instance, you get an email from somebody saying, hey, these mice were in pain, you can't help but feel, feel some angst about that. But at the same time, there are very clear policies that you're following. And multiple jurisdictions, just kind of as a last example of this non-exhaustive list, becomes a really fascinating ethical concern because sometimes there will be an, an instance where multiple jurisdictions, be they different governments or different bodies within a particular geographic area, might each individually say, hey, you know, I have authority here. And depending on kind of what rule book you're looking at or by, by whose guidelines you're looking at, a, B, C, D, E different um, during uh, during different bodies might indeed on paper have the authority, but it might conflict with another's also valid authority. So that becomes a really interesting and, and difficult ethical concern to navigate. All right, let's get back to the topic of this particular session, which is about misinformation and disinformation. So a key distinction between misinformation and disinformation is the question of intent and whether the person sharing the information intended to deceive or not deceive. And how does misinformation and disinformation play into a publisher's role? So now it's really a bit of a paradox because by and large, but the publisher's role is not to determine intent on the part of a researcher, on the part of anybody else. The publisher's role is to address the issues as necessary, whether they be pre-publication or post-publication, and to strive towards the goal of an accurate scientific record. Let's look, for example, at a question of intent with image concerns. This is something that happens a lot, where there might be a figure that ideally is flagged before publication, but oftentimes isn't flagged until after publication, where there might be a problem in the figure. Perhaps there were two panels that it seems were duplicated. There's a really big spectrum of the intent that might have occurred there. Anything from just very innocent inadvertent error, maybe sloppy record keeping, um, you know, messy figure construction, maybe a postdoc didn't have their coffee one morning and copied and pasted the wrong thing. And that spectrum goes all the way to the end of somebody who might deliberately have the intention of fabricating data or falsifying data with the intention to deceive. It's not a publisher's place to determine where that intent is. The paradox comes in because although a publisher does, it's not their place to determine the intent, it's after a certain period of time of working with, with these kinds of cases, it's next to impossible not to at least have some kind of um, you know, kind of like at the in the back of your mind, gut feeling about what the intent was. And do you let that play into your decision making? Ideally, no, but also oh, we're we're humans. And sometimes that might start to kind of come into play, even if you don't realize it. So the the question of intent and the paradox of intent for how a publisher handles ethical issues becomes a really nuanced and um and difficult situation and something that I think it's really important just to be aware of. Keep also in mind what is 
considered to be research misconduct. Um, I'm speaking to you today from the USA, and so I'll just use the Office of Research Integrity of the United States as an example. ORI defines research misconduct as only fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. So fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism in proposing, performing, or reviewing research or in reporting research results. ORI goes on to say that research misconduct does not include honest error or differences of opinion. There can oftentimes be disputes of, well, you know, was it honest error or was there an intention on the part of a researcher, on the part of an author to do something that was inappropriate? Again, it's not the publisher's place to say uh, something really interesting and important to keep in mind. Another really big bucket that I wanna talk about is image-related misinformation because in scientific publishing, image-related misinformation is massive, unfortunately. We're talking about problematic figures, most likely. The majority of these typically tend to be in biology papers, not exclusively, but typically mostly in biology. And that's just because the nature of that kind of experimentation lends itself more than other types of um, you know, physical sciences or social sciences lends itself to possible image, image problems, um, whether it be deliberate, mis de deliberate manipulation or not. Um, problems with images in, in papers is very prevalent, and unfortunately, it's becoming more so. And there is this really kind of troubling crossover now of image manipulation, and I'm going to say that in quotes now because it's not always necessarily bad, of things like artificial intelligence, like DALI, that now everybody has access to. Everybody in their living room can now, you know, log in online and deliberately create a completely fabricated image from whole cloth. That scares the Jesus out of me. I don't know about anybody else. It's um, a lot of people think it's really fun. I think it's a massive concern for down the road. And we're not even talking about video where the um, just the level of what can be done and the difficulty in detecting problems just goes astronomically higher. Unfortunately, the technology to falsify visual information may be advancing faster than solutions are being developed to identify cases. There are software developments that are happening to detect this kind of thing, but it's a huge problem to solve. And just to kind of give you an idea of this, a lot of people are like, well, you know, why, why we have these, these massive supercomputers, why can't we look at something as simple as a, a Western blot and a research figure? and see if there's a problem. So let's look at just like, think of one article, you know, maybe there's seven figures in it. Maybe each figure has five parts to it. Maybe each part has four panels in it. We're talking about in one article, 140 distinct images. And those images, definitely at the point of submission, most definitely at the point of publication, are not going to be digitally identical to the raw version of what the authors had up on their end. It's never going to be pixel to pixel. What the authors created is what comes out the other end. There are file conversions, there are compressions. Something might look similar, but it's not something that you can just plug it into a computer and say, does this match this? And then let's talk about just you know one category of potential image problems in figures of duplication being just one of those categories. If we're talking about one paper with 140 different images, that's gonna be difficult to detect, especially if you can't look at a kind of pixel to pixel comparison. That's in one, one paper. What if you're then talking about you know, the same panel that might've been duplicated in a completely different paper by a completely different publisher by that same author? And then think about something that it's not even the same author. We're talking about, you know, billions at the least of, of different distinct things that we're trying to kind of match up against one another, none of which we're really looking at apples to apples comparisons. So this is like a really high level explanation of, of kind of like scratching the surface of why this problem of software-based image forensics is such a difficult one to solve, but I hope it might give you some food for thought and start to consider like, you know, maybe it isn't as simple as just kind of like pushing a button or um, as a colleague of mine like, likes to say, it's not this Star Trek, Star Trek future where we just kind of go, you know, computer enhance. It's, it's a lot trickier than that. Okay, 
So I think that I've established that we have a lot of concerns that we're trying to tackle across the scope of scientific research publishing ethics. So what can be done? One big thing is just maintaining as much transparency as possible. You know, transparency adds to trust, whether that be transparency with readers, with authors, with reviewers, with other, other publishers and institutions, transparency adds to the trust. We can raise awareness of, um, of publishers' goals, raise understanding of publishers' goals, and uh, raise understanding of the challenges involved, and make sure that publishers correct the scientific record as needed. We can, we can increase understanding about timelines. I understand the frustration about how long it takes things um, to get addressed when it comes to ethical issues. And I understand that those delays can definitely add to mistrust. I understand the appeal of stories, whether they're on Retraction Watch or elsewhere, of super fast actions. You know, we've all seen these stories of, you know, I've, I found this problem in this paper and three days later the article was retracted. That's fantastic, but those cases introduce what can be often really unrealistic expectations. The reality is these things oftentimes take a long time, frankly, often take longer than anybody who's involved in it would prefer that it take. But there's, it's the reality, and, and that happens for multiple reasons. There's the question of resources or the lack thereof. There's the question of the overall complexity of a case, of the numbers of people who are involved, of the multiple rounds of review that are likely required, and of the mindfulness of the potential consequences for everybody involved in a particular case. With that being said, publishers definitely do want to find ways to address things more quickly if possible. Okay, another thing that can be done is increased collaboration between organizations. Um, I mean, this meeting is a great example of that. It's been really heartening to see that um, it seems like there has been a, an increase in cooperation between organizations, you know, sharing information, maintaining confidentiality and all necessary editorial, um, you know, privacy policies, but still maintaining um, sorry, um, confidentially sharing information to address potential misconduct. And lastly, I'd say that a really important thing to, to do is to continue to support software developments and software improvements. Um, I think when it comes to text-based software issues, we're in a pretty good place. Um, I think I, I hope that I've given you a, a, a notion that when it comes to AI for images, um, whether that be image creation or image manipulation detection, image forensics, it's still continue, continues to be a really, really big concern. There are a lot of great groups out there working on things, um, but there's still a really far way to go. So hopefully the next time we all talk, there'll be big steps forward and we can all celebrate that. And with that, that is my time. Thank you so much. And I look forward to speaking with you all in the Q&A.